for Michael O'Neill of Middleborough, England, death was just a vacation. No, I'm not talking about some elaborate near-death experience here, but a real-life variation on death takes a holiday. What happened is that on June 2nd, 2008, Michael decided to take a trip to Australia to visit his friend, but was in such a hurry that he didn't tell anyone in the flat that he lived where he was going. So after a couple of weeks of his neighbors not seeing him, they became worried and contacted the police. The police came and smashed in the front door, and sure enough, no one was in the apartment. It was completely abandoned, and they couldn't find any evidence of what may have happened to Michael O'Neill. Honest mistake, right? (laughs) But things get weirder. A few weeks later... An announcement appeared in the local paper for the death of one Michael O'Neill, a guy who was about the same age as our intrepid traveler, and it mentioned that he had brothers named Kevin and Terry. The bizarre thing is, so did Michael O'Neill, the traveler, have brothers named Kevin and Terry. And so the friends and neighbors of the very much alive O'Neill thought that their worst fears had been realized. That is, until one of them got a postcard from him in the mail that he was indeed down under, but not down under in the way that they thought that he was. Michael arrived home on August 11 to find that his door was smashed in, the police were watching his flat, and that uh, he was again, uh, had the neighbors believing in ghosts as he was walking around. Everywhere I went, said O'Neill to the Daily Telegraph newspaper, he said, everywhere I went, people would walk up to me and shake my hand and said, I thought you were dead. He said, I heard it so many times that I almost believed it myself that I was dead. Jesus himself experienced a similar reception when he too returned from the down under of the grave. Except in his instance, his friends and neighbors saw him die on the cross, and it was no vacation. The events of that Friday left Jesus' disciples, his closest friends, his acquaintances, shocked at the brutal, painful, shameful way that Jesus had died on the Roman cross. The only saving grace in this instance was that at least Pilate allowed his body to be taken off the cross and laid in a tomb rather than left hanging for days to rot in public humiliation as was standard Roman practice. But it wasn't as if Jesus had not told his disciples where he was going. Unlike Michael O'Neill, Jesus very clearly told his friends, his disciples, that he was going to take a trip down the road to Jerusalem and to the cross. In fact, Jesus had given them this fateful itinerary three times. But as Luke says in chapter 18, they understood nothing about all these things. In fact, what he said was hidden from them, and they did not grasp what was said. Because they did not understand what Jesus had told them, they were surprised when they found the tomb door open, when the stone of his resting place was empty, And there was no indication about the whereabouts of Jesus that Sunday morning. Matthew even says that the cops that were there to stake out the place were of no avail. They didn't know what was happening. So instead of Jesus being 
missing and presumed dead, Jesus was dead and presumed missing. No one needed an obituary to determine which Jesus bar Joseph of Nazareth was in the tomb. They just needed to know where the body had been taken. It was an angelic messenger that provided the postcard for his whereabouts. Reports of his death have been greatly exaggerated, they said. He is not here. He is risen, they said. Don't be afraid, they said. He is going to Galilee ahead of you, they said. Go and tell his disciples, they said. Two disciples were on their way to Emmaus when someone came and told them a reminder of all that was supposed to happen, not realizing that it was Jesus himself. And now gathered again in Jerusalem, they were filled with anxiety and grief and confusion over the last three days and were trying to figure out what all this evidence added up to. But then, suddenly, he was among them, saying, Peace be with you. Like the perplexed people of Middleburg, England, these disciples also thought that they had seen a ghost, that they were afraid, and you can understand why, that even in their joy, they were amazed and still wandering. But unlike Michael O'Neill, Jesus wanted people to touch them. He said, touch and see for yourself. I'm not a ghost. I have flesh and bones just like you have. And then Luke tells us that he even asks for a piece of fish from the Barbie to prove that he was alive. That this was no apparition, no collective fantasy, no projection of imagination. Jesus was real, visible, audible, tangible. The resurrection reminds us that we do not have faith, that our faith is simply not a philosophy. These physical details about Jesus' post-resurrection experiences are offered by Luke as a sort of proof, a, a cataloging, a foreshadowing of the central message that these disciples would take out with them post-resurrection. This is what Jesus told them and reminds them that the good news is not simply just his teachings, but the good news is also the death and resurrection of Jesus. Actual events, actual historical documented events that inform and concretize Jesus' teaching. These are the things that... Bring about that full experience of Jesus in our life. The risen Jesus, maybe wiping crumbs of fish from the table, says to them, I'm not a philosophy. I am the risen Lord and Savior who have come to allow you to preach repentance and forgiveness in my name and that it would pro proclaim to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. It reminded them, and so by extension us, that salvation involves not only a set of teachings, but a relationship with an incarnate God. You see, Luke, in the book of Acts, tells us that <laughs> the disciples didn't go around the Mediterranean world setting up... Um, Jesus memorial societies where they would spend time in their 
looking and reflecting on the parables, the sayings of Jesus. No, the disciples went around the Mediterranean world insisting that Jesus was alive, that his death and resurrection had ushered in a new age, the inbreaking of the reign and rule of the kingdom of God, giving us a glimpse of what it will be like on that day when that kingdom comes in full to this earth. And they said, we were actual eyewitnesses of the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. It was only after Jesus' ascension that they finally understood that they were to embody the scarred hands and feet of Jesus, to carry on his ministry, feeding the hungry world, a world hungry for hope, for wholesomeness of forgiveness, for the promise of life made possible by the death and resurrection of our Lord. They hadn't seen a ghost or a resuscitated corpse, two of the most widely accepted reasons for life after death at that time. They had witnessed something utterly new, surprising, and yet overwhelmingly joyful. No matter how bizarre their story sounded, and no matter how hard the authorities tried to crush the movement, they continued to be witnesses to the reality of the resurrection. And here would be a good point for us, Christians today, to remind ourselves what the meaning of that word, that Greek word for witness is. Because it informs us of what we will face as Christians in a fallen world. The Greek word for witness is martyria, from which we get our English word martyr. One who will die for the faith which they hold. Because there in Jerusalem, sometime on that amazing Sunday, Jesus mapped out for his disciples how his ministry had led God's people up to this very point. He led them through a biblical travelogue of the liberation events of Exodus, words of exhortation and warning in the prophets, the pain and hope of the Psalms, and his own road to the cross. His death was an essential part of the witness, one that cannot be diminished or denied. But whenever Jesus is spoken about, whenever the gospel is proclaimed, the resurrection is at the heart and core. Without the resurrection, there's nothing left. If Christ had not been raised from the dead, said St. Paul, your faith is vain. Deny the resurrection, there's nothing left. Ironic, isn't it, that our Lord asks us to die for the belief that a dead man came back to life. Jesus was the original dead man down under. But the passage of time since that Sunday, we, in the distance, have sort of left us feeling not very surprised at all. Easter comes every year, but it usually finds Christ followers debating points of theology or arguing over uh, social issues while the world around us just yawns in indifference. Perhaps that's because we haven't been preaching and engaging in the sheer audacious joy and surprise of the resurrection. We have become so enamored by our churches and our structures and our positions in it that we neglect the incredible claim of the gospel. We act as though Jesus is taking a long vacation. That while we do things in the name of God, we don't really expect God to act 
in our time. Coming back to these verses of St. Luke reminds us that we worship a risen Christ who lives among us. He is with us in his spirit and will one day come back in his resurrected body to bring that full and complete kingdom of God into earth. 1 John 3, our epistle lesson for today, offers us words of encouragement for those of us for whom the joy and of the resurrection is but a distant memory or a theological conundrum. Oops, don't have that on there. John says, Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this. When he, Jesus, is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have their hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure." That first Easter morning, Jesus' friends, his disciples, went to look for the living among the dead. Isn't that still the mission of the church? To look for those who are made alive by God's grace among the walking dead of unbelief in this world. Isn't that the privilege that God gives us in sharing the good news to enable the Holy Spirit to make alive those who are dead by grace through faith? You and I get to do this. And so, the promise of the resurrection means that you and I are always looking for the dead to come to the land of the living. And the surprise here is not that it's done because God is almighty. The surprise is that God did it for you, for me. And so may the peace of God which surpasses our human understanding Keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.